fourth book in the uh, in the series. This book's a bit different than the previous three. In the previous three novels, Book of Three, Black Cauldron, Castle of Lear, you have pretty well-defined quests to achieve. Okay. Um, what's the quest to be achieved in the Book of Three? Defeat the Horned King. Okay. What's the quest to be achieved in the Black Cauldron, obviously? Find and destroy the Black Cauldron. What's the quest to be achieved in Castle of Lear? Rescue Ilonwi. Okay. I mean, that's not what it is at the beginning. The the in usually in quest literature, the quest doesn't begin at the very beginning of the novel. The the main character kind of finds him or herself dropped into it along the way, okay? This one's quite a bit different because the quest in this novel is not to rescue somebody. It's not to find something. It's not to do some great heroic deed. What's the quest? It's for Tara to answer the question, who am I? And that question is important because it doesn't just have to do with genealogy. In other words, Taryn couldn't, you know, proverbially, call up Ancestry.com or 23andMe, do a DNA test, and that would solve his problem. What's the question really asking? Who am I? Bingo. I'm going to just rephrase that a little bit. What's my purpose? Is it, as he continually keeps coming back to in the first three books, is it to be an assistant pig keeper? Is it to be, as Alanwi says, if it is to be an assistant pig keeper, to be the best assistant pig keeper there is, and is there anything wrong with that? Answer the second part first. No, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay? But Taryn feels like there's something more. So, this novel, this one opens. It's springtime. We're told promise of the richest summer to come. Orchards white with <coughs> blossoms. The newly planted fields lay light as green mist. Meaning there is just a shimmer of green. Like, like just the beginning of the shoots are coming out of the ground. Okay? In other words, these, till these fields have been well tilled. Okay? And Taryn's not happy, though. Something's bothering him. And Call says, well, I know what it is. It's because you're pining over Ilanui. It's because Ilanui's not here. Taryn says, no, nah, that's not it. What I want to know, only Dalton can tell me. He goes, I, I wouldn't trouble Dalton. You know, he's kind of a cantankerous old snot. You bet, just leave him alone. His disposition rubs a little thin, Call tells him on page four. But Taryn goes on, he makes his way through the cluster of buildings and such, and we see, right in the middle of page four, the once haughty queen had accepted the refuge Dalbin offered. Remember, Gwydion said at the end of the previous novel, I'm sure if you were to find your way to care, Dalbin, Dalbin would give you a place to live. Once haughty queen, now what? By her own choice, she who had long ago ruled Pradane toiled now at the tasks Ilanri had done before departing for Mona. 
So what's happened to Ocran? Previously, not that we've seen, before the opening of the first novel, many, many years in the past, she ruled. She was queen of Prydain. And now, what does it mean? She's doing the tasks Ilanwi used to do. What task did Ilanwi do? Scullery. Scullery maid. She washed dishes. <clears throat> she probably went and gathered eggs in the morning. In other words, a farmhand. Okay. Notice, that's not any lower, quote-unquote, than Taryn being an assistant pig keeper. They're equally low in, in terms of social status according to one's job, if you want to count social status that way. Okay. Taryn goes to Dalbin's chamber because, you know, he just, he just, he can't stop himself. He's got to find out. And Dalbin says, I never cease to wonder that the young, with all their pride of strength, should find their own concerns such a weighty burden they must be shared with the old. What's he mean? Now what do you want? Come on. But he says, but before you say anything, Ilanwi's fine. Ka hasn't returned yet. He's taken my potion to Glue's cavern. That is, Glue should be reduced in size now. What is Dalbin telling him? Well, the answers to some of his questions. What about Glue? Have you taken care of? So, he says... You've got plenty of jobs to keep you busy, so why are you here? One thing only. Just answer this one question. All that I have I owe to your kindness. You have given me a home and a name, and let me live as a son in your household. Yet who am I in truth? Who are my parents? You've taught me much, but kept this always from me. Dalvin, since it's always been this way, from as long as you can remember, he implies, why does it bother you now? That is, why did you ask me this question seemingly two years ago, four years ago, etc.? Come on, speak up, as Taryn bows his head, doesn't want to answer. If you want truth, you should begin by giving it. That is, tell me really why you want to know. Dalvin knows why he wants to know. So why is he making Taryn say it? So Taryn will admit it to himself. So Taryn will kind of confess it. He'll own up to it. Come on. And he tells us, behind your question, I see the shadow of a certain golden-haired, notice he doesn't say golden-haired farm girl, golden-haired girl, a golden-haired princess. What does Taryn understand about princesses? Royal blood. Keep going. If they're going to marry, they marry someone of royal blood also. Or royal worth, possibly. Okay? Taryn, when Ilanri returns, it's in my heart to ask her to wed. Now, we don't know exactly how much time has passed between this novel and the previous one. Okay. But I think it's fair to say minimum of a year, maybe more. So by this time, depending on how old he was in the first novel, I don't think he was 8. He might have been 10, 11, 12. If he was 12, then between the first novel and this one, he could now be 16, 17. Agrarian non-modern, non-technological society, marrying at 16 is not an issue. Some of you probably have grandparents, great-grandparents, great-great-grandparents that got married at that age. Okay? This I will not do until I learn who I am. That is, but I'm not going to pop the question until I know who I am. An unknown family with a borrowed name cannot ask for the hand of a princess. Borrowed name? 
Well, part of his name is borrowed of Care Dalbin. He's Terran of Care Dalbin. He's not even Terran of Dalbin. Terran adopted son of Dalbin. He's just Terran, I live at Dalbin's place. All right. What is my parentage? I cannot rest until I know. Am I lowly born or nobly? <clears throat> what does he mean by nobly other than royal? I mean, I think we all understand. He means royal. But what does he really mean by noble birth? Respected. Look at the options. What are his options? He says, lowly or nobly. What else other than respected? Louder? Same. For which one? Lowly. Okay. Is everybody of noble birth of royal birth? Not necessarily. What I'm trying to get at is how does Taryn understand nobility? For him, that simply means what? Pride and self. Pride and self. That comes from? Does Taryn really think that, though? He works hard, doesn't he? Heroism, okay. Is that nobility, though? See, for Taryn, heroism, I think Shelby just... Yeah, it's like leading other people. And okay. Right? But where does it come from? Does it come from within? Not for Taryn. Karen, it comes from one thing, heredity. Why? Because Alexander is playing on this very, very, very old idea. It goes back to the early Middle Ages, okay? That one's status in life and therefore one's self-worth is entirely, entirely dependent upon your family bloodline. And if you're not born into the right bloodline, you can never be of quote unquote noble worth. Okay. How many of you saw have seen the film? It's an old Heath Ledger film, um, Knight's Tale. Okay. It's crudely, loosely based upon Chaucer. Okay. And you have this guy who is lowly born, William Thatcher, his last name Thatcher, because his father's name is Thatcher. Why? Because his father and his father before him and his father before him were Thatchers. They put thatch roofs on buildings. Okay? He gets it in his head one morning after his father essentially sells him, gives him into servitude to a knight. When that knight dies after a jousting tournament, he puts it into his head one morning, he's going to pretend to be that knight. At least for a little while. But then he's going to take on a different name. And nobody will really know. But when he starts getting good, and he wants to enter the lists, the jousting tournaments, and by the way, all that within the film, that's all true. They did have like the World Series of jousting tournaments, okay, that knights would travel to, to partake in, to be declared the world's greatest knight and such, right? He has to produce something in order to enter those. They're called patents of nobility. Like today, you invent something, you go to a branch in the United States government, it's under the Treasury Department, I believe, and you get what? You get a patent. That 
means you created it, you own the rights to it. A patent of nobility means you are certified to have the right blood. And when it turns out his patents of nobility turn out to be false, he gets thrown in the stocks. Why? He's mixing it up with people he shouldn't mix it up with. He's rubbing elbows with people he doesn't have the right to rub elbows with. This is why Taryn has to know who his parents are. He won't ask her if he finds out he is of lowly birth. Why? In this kind of medieval mindset, he won't have a right to. Not a right like, oh, patriarchal society, he has a right to I laundry. Right in the sense of it would be inappropriate. It would be morally wrong. Right? So, he goes on and says, um, Am I lowly born or nobly? Dalvin. Uh, the latter would please you better. That is to find out you are nobility. Maybe not a king. Maybe not in line to be a king or prince. Maybe, you know, a duke. Something like that. That would be better, right? Sure. Yeah, that's, yeah. But no matter. If there is honor, yes, let me share it. What does he mean, if there is honor? If I'm nobly born. See, Terrence thinking is, if I'm lowly born, I can't be honorable. I cannot be full of honor. No matter what one does. All right? If there is shame, if my parents were nobodies, if my parents were a couple of bums who lived under a bridge, then I'll have to face that too. Dalvin, it takes as much strength of heart to share the one as to face the other. What does he mean, to share the one? To share the nobly one as much as to face the ignoble birth or to share the lowly birth as to face this one? What you ask, I may not answer. Uh, Prince Gwydion doesn't know either. N nor does the High King. In other words, Taryn, you know, you're kind of an enigma. We don't know who your parents are. Nobody does. I mean, that's what he's really telling him. Nobody knows who your parents are. Okay, then let me go find out for myself. How does Karen think he's going to find out for himself? He's going to go do the 23 and me. How? He's going to wander around per day. Have you met my parents? There's an Eric Carl book. Uh, one of his little board books for kids. That's kind of like that. Are you my mother? Are you my mother? Are you my mother? That's kind of what he's going to do. Dobbin says... You sure? Is this indeed you? He says, I ask nothing more. All right, then. Go for it. Journey, then, wherever you may choose. Learn what lies in your power to learn. That is, what you are able to learn, what you are able to discover, what you are able to find out, do that. I think Dalvin is telling him, but you're not going to find the answer to your question. Why? Because his identity is not out there. His identity is in here. All right? So, page seven. Gurgi says he's going to go. Taryn says, you know, Road's going to be difficult, it's going to be long, it's going to be hard. Gurgi says, I will follow. And we're told, A strange glance of pity crossed the enchanter's face, Dolphins. 
Gurgy staunchness and good sense I do not doubt, he said to Taryn, though before your search is ended, the comfort of his kindly heart may stand you in better stead. If Gurgy wants to go, you should let him go. It's kind of like what Gandalf tells Elrond at the end of the chapter, the Council of Elrond in The Lord of the Rings, when Elrond says, I don't want these other two hobbits, Merry and Pippin, to go along on the journey to destroy the ring. You know, I want to send an elf lord, a warrior, etc. And Gandalf says, you know, I think you ought to trust the friendship here. What's he mean? Taryn, you're going to come across some hard times. You might need somebody like Gurgi. Describe Gurgi. How many of you have a dog? Is that dog ever angry at you? Does the dog ever, when it sees you, not wag its... I mean, unless you beat the dog, okay? But most dogs, you know, show, unlike most humans, unconditional love. You walk up to that dog, and the dog wags its tail and slobbers all over. Okay? That's Gurgi. That's Gurgi. Okay? So, Dobbin says... So be it, your road indeed will not be easy, but set out on it as you choose. Page 7. Though you may not find what you seek, you will surely return a little wiser, and perhaps even grow to manhood in your own right. That is, without the aid of Gwydion, okay, you're going to grow into a real man when you do this journey. So, Taryn gets up early before dawn the next morning. Why? Because he wants to get out of there before anybody can make a fuss. And there's Call, and there's Dalvin, and even Ocran is there. And we're told, towards the bottom of page 8, Dalvin had hobbled into the dooryard. Beside him, Call raised a torch. The old warrior's face was filled with fond concern. Okay. Gurgi's there, says, I'm going to follow. And they head off to the marshes of Morva. Okay. Page 10. Taryn and Gurgi are talking. Gurgi doesn't want to go to the marshes of Morva. Why not? What did they talk about doing to them last time they were there? Turning them into frogs and such. Okay. But Taryn says... But I will face them again. Top of page 10. Nothing is hidden from them. All secrets are open. Okay. It may be true. May not. We have to find out. But what do they do with secrets? They trade. You want an answer to a question? You got to give them something. They would know the truth. Could it not be, could it not be that my parents were of noble lineage and for some secret reason left me with Dalvin to foster? Gurgi, your kindly master is noble. Noble, generous, good. To humble Gurgi. Notice there, what Gurgi's doing is Gurgi is labeling or listing three virtues. Noble, generous, and good. But I think what Gurgi might also be doing is he might be using those second two virtues to describe the first one. That is, he might be saying, Master, you are noble. Why? Because you're generous and you're good. Right? Giving us qualities of nobility. You don't need to ask enchantresses. In other words, you don't need to go somewhere else to find out if you're noble. Taryn, I speak of noble blood. Notice, Gurgi, remember, lost the wisdom of the animals and hasn't yet gained the learning of humans? Maybe he's gained more wisdom than a certain farm boy. Okay, so... They make their way off. And page 12.
bottom of the page, we're told, the three enchantresses, so far as Terry could see, had been busy at household tasks. What does that mean? You don't even need to read anything else. What was what was their cottage like the last time they were there? Shambles. Shambles. I mean, it's a mess. Just crap laying all over the place. Now, Orgok, her black hoods shrouding, shrouding her features, sat on a rickety stool, trying, without great success, to tease cockleburrs from a lap full of wool shearings. So she's got a bunch of a bunch of sheared wool that has all kinds of burrs in it. Okay, thistles and such. And she's trying to pull those out. Orwin, if it was Orwin, was turning a rather lopsided spinning wheel. That is, she's taking the wool that has been carded, that's had all the thistles and stuff pulled out, and she's trying to turn that into thread. The milky white beads dangling from her neck seemed in danger of catching in the spokes. Ordu herself, he guessed, had been at the loom that stood amid piles of ancient rusted weapons in a corner of the cottage. Notice the weapons are rusted. That is, they're no longer useful. The work on the frame had gone forward somewhat, that is, from the last time Terran was there, so he recognizes they haven't finished what was on the loom before. But what was on the loom before is now completed a little bit more. Knotted, twisted threads straggled in all directions. And what looked like some of Orgok's cockleburrs were snagged in the warp and weft. Karen could make out nothing of the pattern though it seemed to him, as if by some trick of his eyes, that vague shapes, human and animal, moved and shifted through the weaving. Now, why might he not be able to make out a pattern? Possibilities. I'm not, ask, I'm not looking for definitive answers. Well, Depending on which side of the loom he's standing on, if he's on the side of the tapestry that's being woven, or the fabric that's being woven, that is meant to appear to people, he would see one thing. If he's on the other side, what's all he's going to see? Chaos. Take Look at a rug. A rug that's woven with an image. You've got the top side, the image is clear. You look at the other side, it's nothing but a bunch of knots and loops and stuff. Okay? That's one possibility. What's another possibility? Well, it could be that the tapestry or whatever is being woven isn't complete enough to really make out a pattern. What's the third possibility? What might be the thing being woven? Might it not be an actual, literal piece of fabric? That is, it might be that literal, okay? But it might suggest something else. How does Taryn's life, if Taryn were to take a moment and reflect back on his life, what would his life look like? In terms of, let's say, a tapestry. Would it have a beautiful image, a pattern that could be followed? Would it look like a, you know, a Rembrandt painting? Or would it be more like a Jackson Pollock? Somebody comes in with a bunch of cans of paint and just starts, you know, splattering stuff. So, we're told, bottom of 13, Terrence starts talking to them, and Ordu says, you are the boldest of bold goslings. Few in Pradane have been willing to brave the marshes of Morda, Morva, and no one has dared to come back a second time. And yet here you are. 
So what does that tell us? Just that. Tell us about Terran. Does his bravery exceed everybody else's? Or is he just a damn fool and doesn't know any better? You alone have done so. Orwin says, oh, he's a brave hero. Well, isn't that what he's wanting to be? Or you, don't talk nonsense, Orwin. There are heroes and heroes. I don't deny he's acted bravely on occasion. He's fought beside Lord Gwydion and been proud of himself as a chick wearing eagle's feathers. That is, he's kind of puffed up himself because he's fought beside the, the prince. But that's only one kind of bravery. He is the darling, has the darling Robin never, excuse me, ever scratch for his own worms. What does that mean? Has he ever had to fend for himself? I mean, usually he's at Care Dalbin, right? Care Dalbin provides his resources. When he's been out on quests, he's been with others, right? He's been with Alanwi, he's been with Fluter, he's been with Dolly, he's been with Gwistel, he's been with Gwydion. There's always been somebody else. Okay? That's bravery of another sort. And between the two, fighting alongside Gwydion and being totally alone, he might find the latter shows the greater courage. That is, moving out, so to speak. Taking, you know, the horns of life with his own two hands. So they continue talking. And in Taryn says, your concern is with things as they are and with things as they must be. Page 14. I believe you know my quest from its beginning to its end and that I seek to know to learn my parentage. That is, you knew I was going to come here. You know what it is I'm seeking. She says, oh, parentage, easy. Choose any parents you please. Since none of you has ever known each other, what difference can it possibly make to them or to you? Believe what you like. You'll be surprised how comforting it is. Just just pick one parent, Taryn. <laughs> Say, Dalvin's your parent, you know. He said, I don't want comfort. What's he want? He wants truth. Be it harsh or happy finding of that, nothing is harder. At the end of the first Harry Potter novel, Harry says, I want the truth. Why is Lord Voldemort out to kill me? And Dumbledore says, kind of like, darn. First question you ask, and I can't answer it. The truth, a beautiful and terrible thing. And therefore, you have to deal with it delicately. But I won't lie to you, Harry. I'm just not going to tell you right now. I'll tell you later. Okay? So, they talk about turning him into things. And Taryn, page 16, says, Will you tell me what I ask? If not, we'll go our way. Don't take offense, okay? So, Ordu says, You shall know all you seek to know. Once we settle on the price. Since what you ask is of such importance, the cost is going to be high. I'm sure you thought about it. Jared's like, yeah, I've thought about it. So, they ask him. Hmm. That little golden-haired girl. She's a pretty little creature. Middle of 17. How delightful it would be to take her memories, spread them out and look at them during long winter evenings. Taryn, even you would not be so pitiless. Really? <laughs> like, is that a challenge, you know? So, Taryn says, I don't have any treasure. So, here, here's what I'll offer you. Whatever thing of value I may find in all my life to come, the greatest treasure that may come into my hands, I pledge it to you now. It shall be yours. 
and you can claim it whenever you please. And notice we're told, the shapes on the loom seemed to writhe before Terran's eyes as he waited for Ordu to speak. Why? She's not doing anything with the loom. And yet the imagery on the loom kind of does kind of go and moves. She says, wow, you'd really offer that? I can't offer anything greater. And you can't refuse that offer. I mean, the greatest thing that I ever find. Yeah, but it's chancy. Because what if you never find anything great? Nothing is all that certain. And very often we've found the poor sparrow makes such a pledge never lives long enough to fulfill it. When he does, he's always, there's always the risk of his turning, well, you know, stubborn. Nope, sorry, can't answer it. But they do give him say, a consolation prize of sorts. Page 19. You might try the Mirror of Lunat. What's that? Where? Yes. Perhaps if you looked into the mirror of Lunat, it would show you something of interest. Taryn, where? Too far, but go ahead, stay here. You know, stay here and get tangled up with us, etc. So, they tell him, in the Lagadarn Mountains. Okay, if you have your book. So, Taryn has left from over here. He's come across to the marshes of Morva, and now they're telling him he's got to come up here to the Lagadar Mountains. So he's pretty much traversing all of Pradain. Right? So now he goes into Cantruv Cadavor, which is right over in here. And he makes his way, page 25, he gets grabbed by a shoulder, uh, by a strong hand, and he meets a man who tells him, I am Aiden, son of Aid, or Adden, son of Ad, I can't remember how it's supposed to be pronounced, come both of you, my farm is no distance, okay, Terrence had his horse stolen, And he says, I, I can't fulfill my quest if I don't have a horse. So he goes off to Adden's farm. And what are we told? Top of 26. The dwelling into which Adden led the companions was only a hut of wattle and daub. Never before in all his adventures had he shared hospitality with the farmer folk of Perdain. And he glanced around as wondering as a stranger in a new land. Well, why did he never mix with the farmer folk? He was farmer folk at Kiradalvin. He wants to rise above all that, right? Who does he hang around with? Kings? Fluter? I know he doesn't act like a king, but he is a king. Okay? Possible kings to be? Gwydion. Princesses? Ilanwi. So now he's among the commoners. Now that he could look more closely at Adden, he sensed honesty and good nature in the man's weathered face. Okay, honesty and good nature are both positive attributes, noble attributes. He meets Adden's wife. She seems nice, okay? Page 27. Adden tells them about why he lives the way he does, why his farm is so ramshackle and kind of run down, that his crops have failed. And he says, bottom of 27, my granary is empty. The more I must toil for others, the less I may work my own fields. Even so, my knowledge is too slight. What I most need is locked forever in the treasure hoard of Anuvan. Okay. And we're going to go into that a little bit later. Terran finds out their son died in battle. 
In Eden's Wife, 28 says, He rode with the battle host when they fought off raiders who sought to plunder us. Karen, I share your sorrow. That means I'm sorry for your loss. But he died with honor. Your son's a hero. My son is slain. The raiders fought because they were starving. That is, the men who raided our farm, they did so not because they wanted to. They did so because they were starving. We, because we had scarcely more than they. They came to us. They came to raid us because it's like we had two loaves of bread and they had one. And at the end, all had less than when they began. What's your point? Don't talk to me about honor because my son is dead. So, Eden says, All save one of my fields lies fallow. Fallow means it's no longer producing. He's just letting the field proverbially go to seed. Whatever will grow will grow, and maybe in a couple years, if he has the ability, he will try to retill. When my wife and I could no longer pull the plow ourselves, I broke the earth with my own hands and sowed it grain by grain. Remember Adion's statement? There is more honor in a field well tilled. He tilled it with his bare hands. Okay. We'll stop there and pick up at that spot on Monday. Ahem. <clears throat>